All right, so what have I done here? Um, I went into a uh, an Excel spreadsheet and I put in one column all the numbers from 1 to 100. And of course, you can only see here from 4 to 51, but it doesn't matter. And then on the column to the right, I put the result of dividing 100 by this number. So 100 divided by 4 is 25, right there. 100 divided by 5 is 20, and so on and so forth, okay? Now, I like pictures, so to draw this or to have an image of this, what I did was a, I created a, um, a graph with uh, these two functions, okay? So one graph is going to have all the numbers from 0 to 100, okay? All the way up in, in the x-axis, and that's going to be the divisor. You're dividing n, a number n, by all the numbers, every single number, in this blue line. And what's the result going to be? The result of that division, or the quotient, is this line, this green, or sorry, uh, orange line, coming all the way down and over towards uh, the, it'll, it's an asymptote to the number one here. So let's check out exactly what's happening to this image. Um, we're grabbing the number n, which in this case is going to be 100, and we're dividing it by one. You can see the blue line ends here a little bit above zero. That's the number one. If you divide a, divide 100 by one, you get 100, which is up here. That's 100. So 100 divided by this number is this number. If you divide 100 by four, which is around here, you're gonna be right at 25. 100 divided by four is 25. So every single point on this uh, straight blue line here, when you when you bring out a, a straight vertical line up, the intersection of that line with this orange line is the result of the division, the quotient. So now we can see that any result past the intersection of these two lines, any result we get after this intersection along this uh, orange line is going to already coincide with a number we already used as a divisor. So that means this result is redundant. We've already used it in this area here. So anything to the right of this intersection is redundant. We do not need it. So let's delete everything to the right of that intersection. And you get this. If you have a number n, you only need to divide by all the numbers from this point, 1, all the way up to this point here at the intersection. But where is that point? Here we can see that it's around uh, 10, well it's going to be right at 10, for n equals 100. So 10 is the square root of 100. Can we prove that uh, this intersection always occurs at the square root of n? Uh, yes, we can do that. Alright, so where does the intersection occur between these two lines here? Well, if we call the first blue line as a function of x, you know, y1 equals x, then you got the straight line. Then dividing a number n by this, all these numbers in this uh, blue line, you get n over x. That's going to be a separate function, y2. So where do these two functions meet? Or where do they intersect? Well, it's when y2 equals y1. And that's where n over x equals x, which is this term right here, or this formula. So if you uh, acquire n out of this formula, you get n equals x squared. And then if you uh, want to acquire x, you get x equals the square root of n. So this intersection always occurs at the square root of n. In this case, n is 100, so x is going to be right at 10, and you can see it right here, it's just before 11, 
10 right there now for us and uh, the sieve that uh, we created using the circles in AutoCAD um, this means that we only need to input circles up to the square root of the number n we want to probe for primes that means uh, if we want to find prime numbers up to the to 10,201 then we need to input 101 circles in the sieve to acquire all prime numbers from 0 to 10,201 which is 101 squared so what do we have so far um, well we have first of all a really cool image to find prime numbers we know how to make this image uh, much more efficient to use less information to find the same amount of prime numbers and we know why we can uh, acquire prime numbers up to the square of the largest number used in the sieve if our largest number used here is um, let's see So 145. I, I've input 145 circles. So that's, uh, let's see, 145 times 145. I can find prime numbers up to 21,025. And that'll be flawless. And that's why I created this poster here, which is uh, so far where the sieve can take me. I got from 20,249 up to 20,611. 20, and if we go up and check it, we can definitely uh, tell it's a prime number because there's only one circle uh, intersecting the uh, prime, uh, the real numbers line. Back at the origin here, um, is there anything else we can tell? Um, about prime numbers using these images and it turns out that yeah there's quite a bit more we can tell about prime numbers um, using probabilities uh, we can deduce a lot of uh, pretty neat stuff about them so I'm gonna show you this stuff next alright so uh, prime numbers and probabilities um, what I did here was I drew a generic prime number here and here you can see the word prime. Um, this image contains uh, many uh, prime numbers uh, just condensed into one single image. So what do we see here? Um, multiples of three. Got multiples of three here. It's this circle and this circle. Um, these are the only two circles or these are the only two locations where the number three or the multiples of the number three can fall where uh, they will allow for a prime number to occur here um, if we add one more circle to the left say that circle is going to be redundant uh, the number three can only fall onto one to three uh, generic locations um, anything more than three generic locations is going to be a redundant uh, location so there's only two out of three possible locations for number three uh, that will allow for a prime, prime number to occur. Uh, what happens to the number five? Here we got the number five, and we got this circle, this circle, this circle, and this circle. So we got uh, four circles out of a possible five circles that will allow for a prime number to occur at this location right here. Uh, so that's four out of five. That's two out of three. Four out of five. What happens to number seven? Number seven is going to have six possible locations that will allow for prime numbers to occur. So that's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, what about the number eleven? Remember, we're only using prime numbers because of the reasons um, I described before. So we got 3, 5, 7, 11. We would have 13, then 17, then 19, then 23, and so on and so forth. So the number 11 is going to have 10 possible locations that are, that are going to allow for this prime number to occur. So what are we doing? 
I'm grabbing the number three and I'm throwing dice. And I'm saying, all right, of all the dice I'm going to throw, two out of every three dice are going to have, are going to allow for a prime number to occur. For the number five, four out of every five dice that I throw are going to allow for a prime number to occur. For the number seven, it's going to be six out of seven dice throws. For the number 11, it's going to be 10 out of 11 dice throws, and so on and so forth. Now, how do I write this into an, an equation? And I'm going straight to my um, website here, which I'll uh, give you the website uh, address later. But um, what I'm doing is I'm multiplying all the probabilities for these dice throws to occur simultaneously. So the number three here can occur only two out of three times. The number five can occur only four out of five times. The number seven can occur only six out of seven times. Number 11, only 10 out of 11 times, and so on and so forth. We're multiplying all these different uh, the probabilities by themselves to get a, a, a combined probability of acquiring this prime number right here. Now, how do I write this into a uh, mathematical equation? Well, what I did was I used a product series expression. Um, this uh, pi symbol represents the uh, product function. And what's basically saying, uh, telling this term here, p minus 1 over p, to um, multiply all the numbers or all the, the results by inputting p equals 3 to infinity. Or, you know, for all primes greater than or equal to 3. All right, so uh, you may be asking yourself, what is this 1 half multiplying this product that we were talking about? And there's a good reason for that. So let me show you what it is. Um, the reason I put that 1 half there is because we only want this uh, whole scenario that we're looking at here to occur in 1 half of the locations of all the numbers. That means what happens if you shift all of these circles, everything you see here, one unit to the right? Well, um, you'll be killing the prime number, and we don't want that. So, you can, and if you go two units to the right, then you're back in square one. So, you only got two points defined, and um, if you shift it one unit over, it no longer works. So you got to tell the formula that you only need one half of all those possible locations. And that's what I did right here. That's why this one half is there. And you would not believe the precision of this formula. It overshoots by about 9% up to 700 billion. And there's a good reason for that. And I know what it is. And I'll explain it to you later. But um, there's a good explanation of why this formula overshoots the amount of prime numbers up to a certain uh, number n. Um, as I said, I'll explain that later.